Well, a very good evening to you. You are just in time for Walking the Talk. My name is Catherine Achenga. Of course, it is a day when the Kenyan government has announced that at least three people in Kenya are infected by the deadly coronavirus. So wherever you are, be sure to stay safe. But we will not be talking about your health. This evening, we will be talking about corruption. And tonight, uh, this evening rather, we are looking at what really is your role as a Kenyan when it comes to the fight against corruption. How many times are you tempted that when someone does something for you, you feel like you need to remove money just to say thank you? Why can't a simple thank you be enough? Those are the questions that we are asking this evening as we just try to unpack how really can we be able to step in and prevent corruption as a Kenyan a citizen. And that is the discussion that we will be having this evening. But before I introduce you to my panelists, as well as the guests who are with us in studio, let me quickly cross over to Safin, who is on the other side of the studio, who will give you some of the lines that you can be able to interact with us this evening. Over to you, Safin, and good evening to you. Good evening to you, Achenga. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is where we start by painting the picture. A very good question you've asked our viewers there. And I'll take you through something that uh, will paint the picture about what you want to discuss today, the National Ethics Ethics and Anti-Corruption Survey of 2017, which provided data uh, to inform anti-corruption strategy in the country. It also touched and even br br break, broke down this further by giving a household view of the status of corruption in the country. The survey was done in all the 47 counties uh, in about 5,977 households uh, with uh, 15 key informants. Now, this is what came out during that particular survey. We are talking about your role uh, in fighting corruption today as a common monanchi and this will help you understand uh, why we are talking about that topic today. Uh, so forms of corruption, uh, bribery uh, took the lead at 66.2 percent uh, followed in closely by abuse of office uh, that was at 6.4 percent then uh, other forms of corruption like favoritism at 5.2 percent and I'll uh, just look at something also that has shaped conversations in the past that is embezzlement of public funds which came at 1.5 percent but you you can see an interesting uh, uh, difference there between bribery and abuse of office, which came in second, 66.2% uh, and 6.4%. So bribery seems to be the most common form of corruption, as we will see when we are looking at this. So reasons for giving bribes, uh, just out of curiosity, many Kenyans who were part of this survey said 49% of them said it was the only way to access the service, 17% it was to hasten the service, 13% said they, would, they gave a bribe to avoid problems with the authorities, 10% it was a norm, like it was what was expected of them, and 3% uh, said that it was uh, actually uh, to avoid paying the full cost of the particular service. So uh, looking at uh, some of the things that are also shaping this conversation here, uh, finally just to take you through uh, uh, one last thing. Uh, Services most prone to bribe, 17.3% uh, is application and collection of birth certificates, 14.6% registration, collection, and renewal of national identity cards. Now, you can look at that interesting survey when you get time, but it paints a picture on how uh, you know, common corruption is in our country and bribe being the leading form of corruption. So today we are talking about uh, what is your role in fighting corruption in the country. And the question that we are also asking you aside that is have you ever given bribe and what was the reason? Have you ever given bribe and what was the reason? So be sure to join this conversation online at KBC Channel One. The hashtag is walking the talk. I will be sampling some of your views in the course of this conversation. It's back to you, Achenga. Well, thank you, Safin. Of course, give us your feedback. She will be back a bit later uh, to sample what you have to say. But for now, let me introduce you to my panelists, the guests who are joining us in studio this evening. We have with us uh, David Gavi, Gavi rather, who is the acting director at the National Anti-Corruption Steering Committee. It's good to have you, David, with us this evening. Yeah, good evening, viewers. Well, next to him, we have Gilbert Sanya Lukoba, who is the Deputy Director, Education Training and Public Awareness at the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. It's good to have you with us this evening. Thank you, Achenga. Good evening, viewers. I'm glad to be here. We are glad to have you. And just you know, listening to some of the reasons why Kenyans find it easy to give a, a bribe, perhaps in terms of, is this a moral question? Is it just the fact that it was convenient? Uh, what do you make of some of the reasons why Kenyans find it easy to give a bribe? I'll begin with you. 
Oh, thank you, Achenga. A very important question. There are various reasons why um, Kenyans give bribes, and the research that has been uh, mentioned already points to some of the reasons. Um, service provision in some of the key government uh, departments has been uh, prone to bribery and uh, those types of uh, uh, unethical and uh, uh, corrupt conduct for years. And because it has become something that has been in practice, then uh, people find it as if it's uh, an acceptable behavior, which it is not. Uh, there is also uh, people want to hasten service provision and service delivery, others want to jump the queue uh -huh. and so on. Um, there are also criminal elements that have uh, invaded public spaces, public office, and they're extorting wananchi, they are holding back service provision and so on, and therefore they're frustrating the very essence for which, you know, you know, taxpayers have employed them. Uh -huh. and so the argument that it's a moral question, would you agree with it, that it's a moral issue? It's not a moral issue. I think an ordinary uh, thinking Kenyan would want service provided free of cost. Uh -huh. And if those services are withheld or some, for some reason they are frustrated at getting those services, uh -huh. they then resort to trying to quicken that process. Uh -huh. So it's a breakdown of systems of sorts. Breakdown of values, mm -hmm. breakdown of systems, mm -hmm. and just the, f the, the fact that this has been going on for quite a long time, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore there is a form of public acceptance. And therefore, the challenge now, and this is why we're here, is to begin to reverse the narrative mm -hmm. and get us back to ways in which we could do business okay. in a way that is acceptable for society. Mm -hmm. David, from where you sit, why do you think it's easy for us to give a bribe? Is it about service delivery or just... It's a habit we found that we've just picked it up from where it was. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chenga, and uh, the viewers. Corruption starts from the heart. Mm -hmm. It is from the heart where I decide, and mind, where I decide whether I'm going to ask for a bribe before I offer the services which I'm employed to offer, mm -hmm. and before I decide whether I will offer the bribe before I'm asked for it or after I've been asked for it. So it is uh, a, an issue that begins from the heart and the mind of every individual uh, Kenyan. Now, <clears throat> the whole issue about corruption, uh, and you could see the reasons that the members of the, uh, the people who are interviewed in that survey, mm -hmm. they advance is because sometimes they are denied services until they offer the bribe. Uh, so uh, and, uh, that brings me to the definition of corruption, which is abuse of power mm -hmm. for personal gain. So the person put in a position to provide services mm -hmm. abuses that office or that power that he has been given, uh, he or she has been given, so that they can then extort money and other, uh, you know, uh, rewards from the members of the public. Okay. So, and I think that is uh, why I am quite excited to participate today on what role the members of the public, the citizens, should play to help fight and prevent corruption. Okay. Your vision, as you know, the National Corruption Steering Committee is a corruption-free Kenya. Mm -hmm. How tenable is that? How possible is it to have a corruption-free country? I will tell you, uh, and for, for our viewers, is that some of the countries like that are today rated as uh, uh, having very low incidences of corruption. Mm -hmm. And I can quote the Hong Kong Special Administrative Re Region mm -hmm. of the People's Republic of China. They, before 1974, they used to have a lot of corruption issues. And today, Hong Kong is rated among 15 least corrupt countries in the world. And what then, uh, what was the trick that happened in 1974? It is that the members of the public uh, demanded that corruption be fought, and they participated very actively in fighting and preventing corruption. That is why they have moved away from uh, what would have been uh, like the Kenyan position 138 mm -hmm. to 15 least corrupt countries in the world. So it is doable, okay. and it can be achieved. Okay. Gilbert, in terms of your strategy as ESCC, what do you have in place to uh, remove the perception that when I, you know, I, I see a policeman, my first instinct is I need to give him money for me just to get away from this. Or when you know, I apply for a job, my first instinct is I need to bribe someone for me to get this position. How do you plan on getting the mindset of Kenyans away from this thinking? A good question. Thank you very much. Uh, viewers, I think it's important to begin from the position that um, 
Corruption is harmful and is extremely expensive to the public. And for that reason, the idea that we must uh, give before we are provided with service itself is something that ESCC is very keen to attack. The first point of attack is actually institutional renewal. And we are working very closely with the uh, Inspector General and the Police Service and the various commissions linked with the work of the police so that the process of uh, self-renewal begins internally to the institution itself. Uh, one of the ways in which this can be done is by strengthening uh, the integrity uh, infrastructure within the police itself so that they look at why is it that we are rated over the years, uh, number one, and, and that becomes something that the police itself mm -hmm. should be very, very keen to do. Even before um, external players like ESCC, other law enforcement agencies like ODPP come in, the institution must renew itself. The other strategy, and therefore ESCC has uh, a, a multi-pronged approach to the fight against corruption. The first is actually systems, systems and governance, uh -huh. making sure that they are correct, that they are working and that they're delivering and they're being effective in terms of um, what they intended to do. Two is public education and awareness, uh -huh. that we must now move from information to knowledge and begin to act on some of these things that the ordinary mwananchi should recover their voice and their dignity and begin to look at themselves as capable uh, Kenyans in terms of the way that they are treated. And that comes as a result of public education awareness and to be able now not just to put information in public spaces, but also to create behavior change, okay. a cultural engineering. Thirdly, we are actually now looking at law enforcement, but much more uh, within the law enforcement, looking at where the money goes. So that if there is a police officer on the road who is collecting bribes, we must really go and drill down, find out where, where is the network, who else is involved. Mm -hmm. After the money has been received, how is it invested? And if it is invested in real estate, then go into what is called asset recovery. Mm -hmm. Recover those assets. If they are looking at uh, receiving money through their mobile telephones, go and apply to the providers of mobile telephony, uh -huh. get to see the uh, chemistry of how this money moves, yeah. whether f through the phone networks okay. or through the banks, recover the money. Uh -huh. So we are having a strategy called uh, go follow the money. Follow the money. And, and, okay. and across the other sectors, not just the police, uh -huh. we are now looking at high impact cases, uh -huh. uh, things that uh, affect the Mwananchi much more directly uh -huh. uh, because the cases are very many and we must begin to look at priority areas the personalities involved, the networks and breaking those networks, uh -huh. that in short is the strategy. Okay. David, are we beginning to see behavior change because we are still seeing incidences where Kenyans are very quick to elect, you know, leaders who are implicated in corruption, leaders who, you know, sometimes their character is suspect. And uh, that is where now the National Anti-Corruption Campaign Steering Committee comes in to work with the public so that the public can stop supplying corruption to the public institutions and the officers who work in those institutions. Mm -hmm. So that uh, we don't get, uh, by the way, uh, viewers, it is very hard for civil servants to bribe one another. They sit and wait for us, the public, to go and bribe them so that then they can share in the evening and they dance and they feel very good. So we need, uh, we need as the members of the public, to then know what is it that we need to do to help prevent corruption from, you know, uh, becoming bigger and bigger. And towards these uh, 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 viewers is that each one of us has a responsibility and has a critical role in fighting corruption. Some of this, we have um, a, a community uh, project being implemented within our village. Mm -hmm. And uh, people come there, the contractor comes, he starts building things, we have no idea, we don't know what is, we don't even know how much has been allocated. So what then we do ourselves is we create awareness to the members of the public on their role in terms of during budgeting, they need to participate in the budgeting so that it is at that level when projects are approved and they are prioritized. Then after that, they need to have a project management committee elected by the beneficiaries so that they can oversight the, the implementation of that. Then they need to be told how much has been allocated and what is it supposed to do and by when. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is when the members of the public then come to appreciate that they have a role, it is then they reverse it now to the 
uh, public officers and they tell them, now, you cannot implement a project here until you talk to us and tell us how much has been allocated, mm -hmm. what is it to do, and then we give you a project management committee. That is how we empower the members of the public. But David, you will see sometimes when, you know, a public participation, you know, exercise is held at, at the grassroots, you will see those who come expecting, you know, that I've come for a meeting, so I expect to be given my lunch, my fare. <laughs> so how do you go around that? When that, 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 that is, and thank you, thank you for that question. That is why we have been creating that awareness that, uh, first of all, there is no money called Pesa Yauma, Mari Yauma. Hakuna. All the money that is brought to us for service delivery and for development is the tax that I paid when I was buying kerosene, when I was buying sugar, when I was buying tea leaves and coffee and so on and so on. When I was buying those things, there was 16% VAT. And that is the money now the government collects and brings it back to help me uh, in, in terms of service delivery. So that is the beginning point, so that we are not seeing people stealing cement from a public project, na tunasema yu ni mari ya uma, inaibuwa, ah ah, ni mari yangu, na wewe. So, and it is, at that level then, we need to say there is no more theft. So it is, uh, it is us, the members of the public, who have then been thinking that uh, mari ya uma equals, you know, government money which can be stolen, and sometimes we participate in stealing uh, that cement, and when it is put in a shop, we go to buy cheap cement, that was stolen from our project. So I really, I, it's double dipping. Eh? Mm -hmm. I gave tax, now I have all, I'm also going to buy my own materials. And I think it is at that level when the members of the public know what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, okay. we tell them, Hudumabora ni hakiyako. It is your right as a citizen of this country, as a taxpayer, to be served and given quality service. It's not a favor. Okay. So it is, it is uh, the members of the public should demand that they be given quality service. Mm -hmm. And I can should conclude that... they also that demand to be paid when they come for, you know... I'm, I'm, I'm coming to that. Uh, the, the, the every government institution today has what is called service delivery charter. Mm -hmm. And in that charter, it says the services offered in that ministry or department. It says how long it will take for you to be offered that service. It says how, what is required for you to provide so that you can be offered the service. Mm -hmm. And if there is any fee, you, it is quoted there. So uh, it is using those service delivery charters, the members of the public should be able to demand. Finally, in that service delivery charter, it says if you are not satisfied with a certain service, then this is the number to call. And it is normally the number for the accounting officer of that institution. In terms of public participation, yes. we have um, a, a challenge here. And the challenge is that the members of the public have been told whenever they attend a certain public participation, then they will be given either a soda or a tea or a fare or a bread and those kind of things to motivate them to go. Mm -hmm. So when the corrupt individuals don't want public participation, then they announce in advance that uh, you come for the baraza, but there is no fair, so that the members of the public do not come. We want that changed, <laughs> and that's why we are creating awareness that it is not about you being paid to go and monitor and supervise and oversight your, your resources. It is about you having the drive to go and monitor and supervise and oversight those resources, okay. as opposed to, uh, you know, when readers tell you, okay. come, we will give you money and that kind of thing. The Gil we should change. Okay. Gil, but how many of us know our civic duty, you know, based on what we always see happening in this particular meeting? It's not many of us uh, actually know our civic duty, but this comes with time, and this is where you are important as media. Media has been a big catalyst in terms of driving uh, public awareness and uh, programs. So away from the two of us who are speaking tonight, mm -hmm. we need everyone to be involved. Media should be involved, civil society, because they operate at the very grassroots. And they're the people that have interlinkages and interactions with community and ordinary citizens. And much more importantly, to begin also to popularize things that uh, the Kenya government has put in place, namely the digital government. Mm -hmm where Mwananchi are able to make their voice heard even through submissions online, whether they're, where they're able to uh, apply for certain services, uh, like um, if, if, if you're looking for a police abstract, for, for example, instead of queuing up, you just go online and pick up that uh, form and be able to now you know, do certain things, or even payments, pay through M-Pesa and so on. The idea is to delink 
the mwanaichi from the person to person interactions okay. and thereby create avenues mm -hmm. that would dignify the, 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 service, uh, the service seeker mm -hmm. but also create avenues where the public servant or whoever it is in the office is not interacting with cash. Mm -hmm. When we starve those officers of that kind of platform, we are going to contribute in a very significant way in the reduction of corruption in Kenya. Okay. We are also now, uh, as part of the civic awareness, investing as uh, the commission in uh, the school curriculum. Mm -hmm. And we are building uh, long term. And having in the uh, competency-based curriculum that is now uh, almost uh, taking off, there are elements there that are very strategic and they are very deliberate uh -huh. about empowering the Kenyan child and thinking through the future 20, 30 years from here of a Kenyan who would be aware of their rights, okay. but who will also be a person of integrity and who would uh, be patriotic enough uh -huh. to say no to corruption at the personal level and have the voice to begin to question uh, conduct of public officers. Mm -hmm. We'll also be talking about how do we change the mindset of you know the, the adults. This one you're talking about netting it from when they're still young, but that is in just a bit. But for now, let's quickly just cross over to the other side of the studio where Safin is to get feedback uh, that we currently have. Uh, uh, but we'll be getting to her in just a bit. But before we do, I'll just allow you to quickly answer. You've talked about you know what you're going to do for the young people. What about you know the adults? They say it's not possible to change an adult. I don't know how true that is. Uh, yes. Um, many of us that are this age perhaps are not as helpful in the war, but I would still insist that we are. Because you see, we have uh, jurisdiction and spaces that we influence. For example, we are parents. Mm -hmm. Really, we must be, play our role rightfully and bring up our children in uh, uh, an upright way. We have a brand as, as, as people, as parents. Mm -hmm. I'm sure even those that are corrupt, uh, privately, I think if you go to their homes, they try as much as possible to encourage their children to work hard. Mm -hmm. And that is the spirit. They should desist from corrupt conduct. Because when you start feeding your children with things that are gotten out of theft, you are actually bringing uh, a curse mm -hmm. to these very people. And I know of some people who uh, could be corrupt. And they have tried to take their children to schools abroad and do give them very expensive education. But these children have ended up not succeeding and ended up in uh, very bad places mm -hmm. uh, just because you know they are feeding from the corrupt uh, hand the the other the other way is uh, essentially to begin to look at uh, how do we punish corruption mm -hmm. uh, there must have been cases where now okay. kenyans are aware uh, governors that have been uh, debarred from accessing public office mm -hmm. and uh, things to do with uh, basically creating an environment mm -hmm. that frustrates the corrupt people Okay. And we have a role there, even if we are senior citizens, mm -hmm. the way we vote. Mm -hmm. We vote on the basis of ethnicity, we vote on the basis that we've been bribed, mm -hmm. and that itself creates a climate, a very rich climate, okay. for bad behavior in office. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that we can do even as adults, um, in, in terms of like changing the narrative and begin to transform Kenya. Okay. Let's now go to Safin. I, sh I understand she's ready for us. Safin, what do you have? All right, Achenga, a lot uh, has already been said on social media with regards to the war against corruption. And remember, you can be part of this conversation as well at KBC Channel 1 at Kato Aching at Safin underscore Aching. The hashtag we are using is uh, walking the talk. And uh, now taking a Corruption is the key to ending Kenya's woes. Amending the constitution only evades uh, the problem. I'll take uh, another one from uh, Eric. Eric, you say, Kenya, the sleeping sickness continues. By the time this country wakes up from its long corruption dream, our neighbors shall be kingdoms. We shall bow down to them. We shall be there. They shall be Balala Simon, you say, in Aitwa Kenya Yetu, where people loot while others die from, from hunger. Looters are freely walking while others are fined because uh, they are carrying luggage. Uh, one uh, lady here, because of the coronavirus outbreak, of course, people are also uh, using this, uh, uh, you know, scare. In Kenya, corruption is deadlier than coronavirus. So uh, you can just see the <laughs> magnitude. Corruption in Kenya is deadlier than coronavirus. Another one also talking about coronavirus. Corruption, Ikokila Mahali, Kama, COVID-19. Imagine. This is one. It's Trevor K.E. And finally, Elmi Yabe. You say Kenya is uh, 
too disorganized and very busy with bribery and embezzlement at every level of the state. Thank you so much for your feedback. I'll be sampling more when we come back uh, from this short commercial break. Plus, remember, we have a studio audience uh, with us. We'll also be engaging them when we come back from this particular break to also add their voice in the conversation that is going on today. We take that break now. Channel One. Nakona bwana leo kutoka ukirudi hapo na kijipe. Na wewe bwana uli retire. Kijipe sasa hivi ulipata? Sasa mke wangu na uzungumza wanisikiza ama wanitizama. Sasa tanga kwa. Nachelewa kidogo mimi. Nilikuwa kuna mambo mambo kidogo hapo nyumbani na bibi kabisa alikuwa sitaki ajue. Wewe unyere nyere mganga kafati. Wewe unyere. Ha? Ha? On the next episode of Elena's Ghost. You were right, Eduardo. We have to take Daniela back to the clinic. Of course, it's what's best for her. But what made you change your mind? What happened? Latonia, can you hear me? Latonia, please wake up. Oh my God. Something up there is on fire. Listen to me. Something's on fire. Something's burning up. Something's on fire. Elena! 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 back if you're joining us you're watching walking the talk our discussion this evening centers around how really do we change the public perception how really do we change the narrative to move away from issues of corruption the public being instrumental in preventing corruption and for more insights of that of course i'm talking to david gadi who is the acting director at the national anti-corruption steering committee i also have with us gilbert sanya lukoba who is the deputy director education training and public awareness at the ethics and anti-corruption commission but before we continue with our discussion uh, I'll just allow Safin to quickly take feedback from our audience in studio before uh, we continue to the second part of this particular discussion. Safin? Of course, this is a part where we allow our studio audience to have their say in the conversation that you are having. I'll start uh, with the lady uh, just next to me. Start with your name and your brief question to the panel, please. My name is Caroline. My question is, so what do you do when the time frame is is very small and how do we expose we as the youth we, ex we expose the um, corrupt people and the corrupt leadership in the society thank you for your question next question from um i'm um, um, sangfi lemon um i want to ask uh, i presented for example petition to parliament concerning relinquishing powers to chiefs uh, church elders and other stakeholders on the grassroots and I feel like nothing was was done or they, they are just dismissed. So when one want to give a petition concerning corruption, where do people go and present their pe petitions? 
Thank you for that question. Just hand over the mic to that gentleman. Uh, maybe I should ask that uh, we have been singing the same tune about corruption day in, day out. And I think your commissions have been there actually quite some time. Don't you think it's time we change the method upon which we are, we are using like sacking members? Anybody who, is in, who has been found in corruption should just be sacked to pave way. Because sometimes you realize that we have a lot of political influence from the from the public. Thank you for that. Allow us to take, uh, to respond to those and then we'll come back to the next set of the questions. Achenga. All right, thank you. Oh, we'll just begin with the first question, David. Yes, I, I, and I think the, the issue was how can the youth uh, expose, uh, and that, that, that was what Caroline asked. Uh, to, to begin with, the youth are members of the National Anti-Corruption Campaign Steering Committee through the National Youth Council, which is a fully-fledged member of the National Anti-Corruption Campaign Steering Committee. Now, we, what we do is, uh, in the, during uh, the campaigns, we segment the population, and the youth is one segment, where we engage with them, the border border, the people at home, the, through the churches and so on, mm -hmm. so that we can be able to, you know, you cannot go to hunt an animal that you don't know how it looks like. Mm -hmm. So we need to empower the, power, the, the youth so that they can, be, they can know how this corruption, what is corruption, how the types of corruption, the negative effects and the actions they should take so that they can help fight and prevent. Mm -hmm. So ours is to create that awareness and we, we have been doing that with the, with the, with the youth in various uh, uh, segments. And I think she also asked about the time frame, the time when you know you want to expose a corrupt uh, practice and the time when, you know, by the time you're coming to, to react to it, it's often too late to prevent it. It has already happened. I, I, and I think, uh, I'm, I'm sure my colleague Gilbert will talk more about it. Eh? But the thing is, immediately the demand is placed on you that uh, like uh, I think uh, what we have been hearing mm -hmm. is that whenever you go out to an office and yeah. you want maybe a birth certificate, you are told unless you bring 2,000 or until you bring 5,000 or whatever amount of money it is, I think the best is to report to the nearest ESCC office or Huduma Center. Okay. Uh, and I'm sure Gilbert will tell us where they can be found. Mm -hmm. Because uh, that way they will, they will spring into what is called the... Uh, 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 Rapid. Uh, rapid. Response. rapid response. And the pharaoh will be arrested and will be found with that, with that money. Mm -hmm. Gilbert, I, I think you should also take the question regarding you know, what he said, the petitions and where do you get help in yes. terms of once you've reported, what next? Caroline, thank you very, very much. I know that uh, many Kenyans out there are looking at us and uh, uh, looking at your question especially, which is a very key one. ESCC has a presence at uh, Integrity Centre in Nairobi and also in 11 regions, as well as in all the Huduma desks, all, all the Huduma centers, ESC has a desk. So use whatever approach that suits you to be able to make a physical contact with those offices to report. There are other avenues. There is the Facebook. Uh, so if you just go to ESC Kenya, you can use Facebook as youth, and I know youth really are users of Facebook. Mm -hmm. If you are at Twitter, just go at ESCC Kenya, and you'll be able to make a report. Those reports will be, will be part of the documentation, and they will trigger an action, an action from ESCC itself. You can also use hotlines, and I would like you to, uh, to thank you, Carol, but also use this chance to share with Kenyans the hotlines. Um, if you have a pen and you're listening this evening, please uh, take down the following numbers. Uh, the hotlines are 0715 Zero, zero. I repeat, 0715-007700. Zero, zero, the other one is 0783-777-00. I repeat again, 0783-777-00. The last one is 0727-285-6633. Double, I repeat again. 0727285663. You can also go to our website and report anonymously. We have a system there called uh, BKMS. It's based in Germany. Not even uh, the officer of ESCC will be able to know your name, but the report will come to us. You only just need to tell us who, okay. where, and all those uh, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, things. Mm -hmm. uh, what about, you know, the question by the gentleman that he, he took a petition to parliament and nothing has happened to it. And that's what you'll hear most of the time the public saying, I brought a petition to EACC, I took a petition to parliament. What happens next when your petition is not responded to? On matters of the petition that my brother here uh, took, which was to relinquish some of the government services to churches and so on, mm -hmm. that, that is an almost impossible petition. You see, the government works through structures. And uh, it's not possible that the government would cede some of its services to the private sector or the or civil society. Um, all that needs to be done in terms of uh, 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 you know, law enforcement reforms uh, if there are petitions that have to do with the work of ESCC, mm -hmm. it's perhaps uh, better to bring them to ESCC itself or bring them to the office of the Attorney General. Okay. Because that is the line ministry responsible for issues of governance. And it's taken very seriously. Uh, because uh, they would eventually take those uh, reform uh, uh, submissions to Parliament anyway. Uh, and so the, in terms of just uh, being uh, uh, strategic, uh, it may not help to take some of those petitions directly to Parliament. Or, or even in terms of opportunities that arise, such mm -hmm. as now the BBI, some of those will be things that can be submitted for purposes of helping uh, make legal reforms. Okay. But I would suggest that you take it to the line uh, uh, ministry, in this case, the Office of uh, the Attorney General and the Department of Justice. And that, that way you have um, a almost um, uh, a sure sign that it will move further than uh, what you intend. Okay. I think I think there is uh, the idea of also you're doing things differently. Yeah, what what can you do differently from what you're doing currently? Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, already in our uh, main submissions, we did allude to the fact that now there's change of strategy, invest in behavior change programs, mm -hmm. go the way of school, the curriculum. Let the curriculum not just uh, check students in terms of how they perform academically, but also other, other attributes like children who are helpful, who are patriotic who are generous, who are team players. Those are some of the elements that need to be rewarded at the school level. Okay. And if we create a level where people graduate from the school system, having all these uh, pro-public uh, attributes, mm -hmm. like just being patriotic. If you love your country and you're able to die in defense of your country, you would obviously not want to harm your country. And those okay. things Let, let's contribute. Stop, let's stop from there so that we can also get uh, more questions could on I, the other I side. Add, could, no, let's just get more questions, then you can take them. Okay. Cumulatively, Stephen. Uh, let's begin with a question from John. John, you had a question. Yes, my question just simple. As a commission, what are you doing to protect whistleblowers? Because we young people will feel like we want to report, but after reporting, what next? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Let me also cross over to this side and begin with the lady. Brief question. Um, my name is Esther. I wanted to say why why do we why don't we put CCTVs? The, in the office, the public office. And again, you said about the, the phone numbers to call, the service delivery charter. I believe that those pe those, the, the numbers are not in, in, in every office because I can remember I went to Sharia House and the guy was telling me that to register a group, I know it's 2,000, but the guy was telling about the 30,000 and it will be out within one week. But now when I, when I ask, like, I'm like, what about the normal one is 2,000. So then I ask, then why, why you, the quest that 30,000 is coming from? Then he's like, ah, you just come, we'll talk. But now I could not, I could not see the, the number that I can report the guy to all, um, all the office that I can report the person. And again, like, why, why don't you give the media the responsibility that they can help us to report the cases about the corruption thing? Thank you, Thank you for your question. Okay, I'm Peter Austin. I have uh, a concern, a command. Um, just speak up. Yeah. A comment to ask. Following the release of the report th just the other day, that showed uh, the, the performance of some leaders. It was clear that uh, the most performing leaders are youthful leaders. Can this be an indication that this Kenya needs youthful leaders to take up oh. this uh, country forward? Oh. Two, uh, how, are you, how are you working to protect those citizens who are ready to uh, report the cases of corruption because we fear for our, for our lives Thank after you so much. reporting. Thank you, Pastor Thank Mike. You. For us. Just one final question. My question is to the ESAC. It is clear that the money that you recover in an year is almost less than the money that we lose through corruption in 23 minutes. Will you explain this one more? Thank you so much for that. Uh, let's uh, ju just, just very brief, briefly. Oh, my name is Andrew Shonko. 
my question is uh, what can just a mayor ordinary mwananchi do uh, to fight corruption when it in involves a high ranking government official or uh, the executive all right uh, maybe the panel can respond to those Sachina. okay i think we'll begin with the last question <laughs> 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 david okay. Yeah, th thank you very much. Um, I think there is a lot that the members of the public can do, but uh, let me begin by the question that was asked on what can be done differently. Previously, we have been uh, focusing more on the enforcement agencies, the government agencies that have been established to fight corruption, uh, and we expect them to deliver. The truth of the matter is those government agencies require the support of the members of the public. And every time uh, uh, Achenga and all the viewers is that um, we have hammered the government institutions so much that they have done practically almost everything possible that should be done to be able to fight corruption. Take, for example, the formation of the multi-agency team against corruption. This is the team chaired by the Honorable Attorney General of the Republic of Kenya that brings together all the investigative uh, bodies, all the prosecutorial bodies, all asset recovery bodies and carry and everybody so that they can work seamlessly and be able to address all the corruption issues. But for those institutions to succeed, they will need the support, they will need information from the members of the public, they will need the members of the public to go and record statements and adduce evidence in the court of law so that they can be able to then secure convictions. So okay. I think the, 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 the public will need to play a role, and I think that is now what I've been asked. Uh, what is the role of the public? I think the first, of the, first the role of the public we is We have to, about five minutes to go, so... Uh, yes. Yeah. First of all, the role of the public is for them to understand that they, they, have, they, they have to demand for good services and quality services. Number two, they stop participating. Don't offer bribe. Don't ask for bribes, or don't just sit and watch as corruption is taking place. Take some action against corruption. If it is in terms of development, remember the development is to the public, is to the citizen. Please participate actively in the fighting and preventing corruption within the implementation of public projects by doing a simple thing participate in the implementation through project management committee. And don't always expect to be paid when you participate. <laughs> All right, Gilbert, the question about feeling protected when you report. Yes. That uh, one has arisen in this discussion. Yes, I want to be very direct because of time. There is now a Witness Protection uh, Act and a Witness Protection Agency in place. I think we need to uh, tell the viewers that this is an avenue that can help to protect people that are witnesses. Mm -hmm and uh, including even concealing your identity, even uh, supporting the witnesses with some resources, and so on and so forth. So uh, I would uh, tell John, who asked that question, that please, and others, and Kenyans and the viewers generally, that this is an avenue that we need to explore. The Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act also has uh, a provision that those that are uh, whistleblowers are protected, including uh, not being able to be sacked, uh, where it's proved that they're being uh, targeted because of their reporting. So those are some of the mechanisms that I can, uh, in very, a very brief, talk about. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to go to the question, I think, of my uh, brother there about uh, recoveries being less than uh, ESC's budget. Yes. It's actually not c uh, correct. In the year that has just ended, ESC disrupted through intelligence and also recovered assets worth about $9 billion. Now, the budget of ESCC is just about $2.9 mm -hmm. So in terms of the things that it has done, and even some of the cases that have gone to court where uh, you know, uh, leaders and governors have been barred from accessing office while the case is continuing, there is potential that uh, a lot of corruption has been prevented in that format. So let's look at uh, 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 the gains, the cost-benefit analysis, in that format. There is what is prevented from actually taking place, mm -hmm. but there is also what is actually uh, physically recovered. And from the data and the statistics available, all pointers are that ESCC is act and others as well. If you put in what uh, the Asset Recovery Agency is doing, if you put in what DCI is doing, ESCC, all those agencies working mm -hmm. as multi-agency team, they're actually recovering uh, perhaps much more than the money that they spend. Mm -hmm. So there is value for money, in other words. Mm -hmm. That's how I want to encourage uh, uh, Kenyans. Mm -hmm. Now, about Let, youth. Okay, our, our time is almost up, but I want to take you back to you know, what you've said about the witness protection 
what, what really does it entail to be protected? Because th that is where there is a lot of you know, lack of clarity when you tell there's a witness protection program. What does it mean? First, you must be uh, a whistleblower. And there's a difference between a, a whistleblower and a witness. A whistleblower is the first point of the release of information that is perhaps not in public domain. Information that is perhaps being, uh, people are doing X, Y, Z to further their schemes of corrupt conduct. At that stage, the person remains a whistleblower, an informer, in other words. But the point at which the informer or that co uh, case goes to court, and there is the requirement that uh, evidence be produced, that uh, statements and witnesses come to testify, then that whistleblower at that stage, they have become a witness. Uh -huh. So there are two people here that we require to talk about very carefully. In terms of whistleblowing, there are various things that you can do. The first and foremost one that you must do is where the information is so sensitive or the report is so sensitive, report it anonymously. Uh -huh. Don't give your name. That's one way to protect yourself. But where it comes to a point where now you are a, a witness and you are appearing in court, then at that stage, the Witness Protection Agency, the WPA, would be able to come to your support and protect you. Uh, conceal your identity, change your residence, perhaps move you out of the country and protect you. If you're giving evidence through video link, distort your voice so that you are not at any one at time uh, endangered mm -hmm. because corrupt uh, networks can be very, very uh, uh, dangerous. So okay. I wanted to make those distinctions. Okay. Our time is up. But uh, David, I just want you to quickly you know, tell us in which environment, you know, in, in your experience, does corruption thrive and how do we stop it? Uh, thank you very much. Corruption thrives most where the members of the public do not have the information that they should ordinarily have. Mm -hmm. For example, you have a project and you don't know how much has been allocated, so the fellows will play around with all the money. Mm -hmm. So it is important that the members of the public are given that information. And if we are not given, they should demand for it. And of course, demand for transparency and accountability in the conduct of the public affairs. Mm -hmm. I think that is what they should do. Okay. From where you sit, Gilbert, where does it thrive and how do we stop it? Already the reports that have been, uh, you know, highlighted even at the beginning of these programs point to areas where the Mwananchi uh, uh, intersect with the service providers. And you find it in, uh, you know, the police, especially the traffic, because there's a lot of, you know, linkages. Mm -hmm. Registries of land, registries of births, registries of uh, uh, identity cards. Mm -hmm. Those areas that are, you know, people s sometimes think it's small corruption, 50 bob, 100 bob. That is very harmful because the people already being extorted mm -hmm. are poor already. And they are looking for these services to just be able to, if you're looking for an ID, okay. it's with a view to unlocking potential of, oh. say, a young person. Mm -hmm. And if those people are denied those opportunities, you're actually marginalizing and making them uh, m much more poorer even. But from the other perspective, you have the anti-library law, which, yes. which you're coming up with. Have we seen incidences where, you know, the, those who have given a bribe, you have arrested them as CACC? Uh, yes. Uh, if you perhaps uh, remember, this law is not very old. It came into being in 2017. Mm -hmm. So it's a law that is being uh, tested. But there had been a section in the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act that talked about bribery. Of course, this is a much bigger law. It, it, it involves the private sector as well. Uh, usually in investigating bribery, you're looking at both the giver and the receiver. But in most uh, uh, instances, the receiver is actually the one that uh, has the bigger latitude. Mm -hmm. They're using because office. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes, uh, because it takes two to tango, okay. it sometimes uh, it's uh, prudent to use the giver, especially if they're in a, a position of weakness, mm -hmm. which many of them are, mm -hmm. to be able to net the, the receiver. The receiver. Uh, because okay. the receiver is habitual. <laughs> and sometimes they are very aggressive about uh, receiving. Okay. Yeah, and, and so, therefore, sometimes we use a, a witness who is the giver to. And in some cases, we've also okay. worked with the Our police. Our time is really up, <laughs> so we'll have to stop there. Okay. But thank you so much for your time. <laughs> of course, we've been talking to Gilbert Sanya Lukoba, who is the Deputy Director, Education Training and Public Awareness at the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. We also had with us uh, David Gadi, who is the Acting Director at the National 
the, the acting director of the National Anti-Corruption Steering Committee, just looking at the role of you as a citizen, what really do you play, uh, what role do you play when it comes to trying to prevent corruption? And of course, the most important thing is try not to give the bribe. Well, this is where we have to put a cap. My name is Katrina Chenga. Let me quickly hand you over to Safin to take a final feedback before we completely wrap up the show. Over to you, Safin. Such an eye-opening conversation there, Chenga. At a time when bribery remains the leading form of corruption, that's according to the National Ethics and Corruption Survey by the ESCC. And uh, Brendan Jockey on Twitter, you say this is a man-eat-man -man society. For you to get assistance, you must jot in some cash. Pesa ya chai, they say, to stop corruption, we must start internally as individuals before we target the big fish. As stakeholders in the war against corruption are doing their part, what are you doing in your small corner of the world? My name is Safin Aching Oma. I'll see you next time. <laughs>